Hi, my name is Tom Chick, and I'm here to teach you how to play Mystery Motive for Murder. Or as I like to call it, just mystery. Uh, the whole Mystery Motive for Murder is a little too precious. Actually, technically, it's Masterpiece Mystery Motive for Murder. But just go with mystery. Don't forget the exclamation point, but mystery. As you can see from the box, this is a game based on the works of Edward Gorey. So I should warn you, I'm predisposed to like something based on the works by Edward Gorey. Uh, this is basically a tile laying game. But what I quite like about it is how expressive it is about the kind of characters you might find in Edward Gorey's stories. And their idiosyncrasies, it makes great use of his artwork. Uh, so if this doesn't work for you, I apologize. I quite like this game. For this tutorial video, I'm going to break this down into five easy sections. The first section, I'll explain the basic pieces and their interactions to you. For the second section, I'm just going to give you the overall game structure. In the third section, I'll tell you about motive cards, which mix the, the action up a little bit. In the fourth section, I will be telling you exactly what actions a player takes on his or her turn. And then finally, the fifth section will deal with some basic bookkeeping. So, pieces and interactions, the game structure, the motive cards, player actions on his or her turn, and then finally some bookkeeping basics. So let's get to it. Among the most important components in mystery are what are called interview cubes for different, uh, different colors for each player. You will note the colors are a lovely kind of muted pastel. These are known as motive tokens. We'll get to those in a moment. This body token distinguishes the victim from the suspects. And perhaps most importantly, a stack of tiles represents the suspects. The very first thing you'll do before a case is create a crime. There's no case until someone's dead. So we take the first tile, we flip it face up, we place the body token on it, and if there's one thing we know for sure, it is that this person, in this case Sheldon, is not the murderer, because he is, in fact, the murderee. Sheldon, you're off the hook. You can't very well have murdered yourself. Now what we have to do is find out who has the most motive to kill Sheldon. And the way we do that is by placing tiles around Sheldon. Tiles can go adjacent, of course. When you place them, there are a couple of rules. The first is that the tile must be upright. The tombstone must be pointing in the same direction. Herr Otto cannot stand on his head. That is illegal. He can't come flying in horizontally. Also illegal. Needless to say, he has to be face up. However, you do not have to align these arrows when you place a tile. If the arrows do not align, that's legitimate placement, and what it means is there is no relationship between this tile and this tile. In this case, with this placement, Herr Otto doesn't even know Sheldon. They've never even heard of each other. However, if we place the tiles in a way such that the arrows connect, now we've established a relationship. Now, an important principle in mystery is that the only arrows that matter, the only connections, are the ones that are flowing in towards the victim. The ones flowing out away from the victim, they're immaterial. We might as well assume they don't exist. In fact, I'm not even going to read to you the text for this arrow. However, what is hugely relevant is that this 5, which represents hate, uh, and 5 is the degree of hate, the highest you can go, I think, uh, naturally is a 6, so it's a very strong hate, moving in towards Sheldon indicates that Herr Otto hates Sheldon. The way we represent this without being confused by this three is we take a motive token. They're all uh, double-sided for love and hate. And we cover the arrows so that it's very clear at a glance there is hatred between Otto and Sheldon and what the degree of it is. Pretty straightforward. Similarly, if we line up tokens that indicate love, here's an interesting example. There's a hate arrow going out, but we don't care about that. Ignore it. Pretend it's not even there. I'm not even going to read it to you. What's relevant here is there is an arrow moving in towards the victim that connects. Therefore, 
Herr Otto is the father of Sheldon. We take a token with a three on it. We place it on the love side and put it there just so that it's very clear what the relationship is. Now, another very important thing to track is who placed Otto? Which of the detectives, which of the players, we're all detectives, has, point, has, uh, has placed Otto in the matrix of suspects? Whoever it is takes his or her interview cube and puts it on Otto's tile. That will never change. These can change by various factors, but that is, of course, consistent. Herr Otto is always and only the suspect of the purple player. Now, it's also worth pointing out when, and this is pretty straightforward, when you place a tile, it has to be straight on. This, no, no, please. That's so aesthetically unpleasing. Why did you even think you could do that? They have to, of course, line up that way. Uh, this is called when two tiles are adjacent, or when a suspect is adjacent to a victim, this is called a direct relationship. A direct relationship is pretty straightforward. You simply look at the amount of hatred the suspect has with the victim, and that is how much motive he or her has. In this case, Otto has five points of motive towards Sheldon. If Otto loved Sheldon, if Otto was Sheldon's father, instead of someone who is caught spying by him, this is zero points of motive. You only have motive in a direct relationship when you hate the victim. Now, things get slightly more complicated when we, when we furthermore point out that tiles can be placed adjacent to someone who's adjacent to the victim. Or, in other words, a tile can extend from the victim up to two spaces. One, two. This is a legitimate placement. Madame Delphine would have a five going towards Otto. Remember, the only arrows that matter are the ones that flow in towards the victim. Uh, in this case, Otto was caught spying by Sheldon. We'll pretend that goes like that. In this case, Otto has five points of motive towards Sheldon. This is a direct relationship. This, however, is an indirect relationship to Sheldon, our victim. Now, as long as it alternates between love and hate, this character here has motive. And the motive she has is an accumulation of the direct relationship and the indirect relationship. So very straightforward. In this situation, Madame Delphine has five ten points of motive. Herr Otto has five points of motive. The most motivated suspect, are what's called our prime suspect, right now is Madame Delphine. Now, it's worth noting, and I think this is pretty straightforward, I'm going to break the rules but pretend this is a love relationship. In this situation, they both have zero points of motive. Someone who loves someone would not kill the victim. Someone who loves someone also would not kill the victim. Similarly, again, I'm ignoring the arrows and just placing these. Pretend that Madame Delphine hates Herr Otto, who hates Sheldon. Herr Otto has five points of motive. Madame Delphine, it has to alternate. It has to go hate love or love hate. Has zero points of motive. Um, Whereas, if we do this, it alternates love, hate, uh, hate, love. Madame Delphine has 10 points of motive. As long as it goes love, hate, or hate, love, it accumulates. It's still worth noting, however, Herr Otto, zero points of motive. Madame Delphine, 10 points of motive. All right, so now that you have those basics, one of the things you might consider doing is running through a test game, a test round. Uh, I generally don't like to do that sort of thing um, because I feel that once players get going with the game, they just want to get going with it. If you play a little bit and then back up and you're like, no, no, let me teach you some more stuff, uh, that might work better for some groups than others. Um, so if you think your group is open to that, let me show you how you could play a really quick test round to make sure they understand the relationships with the motive arrows, the character tiles, the interview cubes, uh, primary motive, uh, suspect, secondary suspect, that sort of thing. Uh, consider doing this. You don't have to, just consider it. Once you've explained to the players the interaction of the tiles and motive points, hate relationships, or love relationships, that sort of thing, you might consider running this test game which will let them practice navigating that interaction of pieces. 
what you'll do is you will take the stack of tiles. Watch me riffle shuffle these. Yeah, how about that? You will shuffle it. You will then deal each player three tiles to their hand. And then you will take the stack, set it aside, flip one tile up to be your victim, put the body token on him or her. Poor Lady Louisa has been murdered. Now going around the table one at a time, each player will consider his hand, choose one of his tiles to play on the table, lining up the arrows. Or again, not lining up arrows, that's a legitimate play, but what they're trying to do is get the most points. Here for instance, that's six points of hate, player would then place one of these and make sure, this is an important thing to teach the players to remember, put his or her cube on the suspect. The next player then goes, places one. I'm just going to make up these. Oh, there, that's not bad. And the next player goes, places one of them. Four points of love, which remember does not actually give you any motive points. And we go around, and by the way, after a player has played a tile, he or she draws a new tile to his hand. Eventually, you will have placed suspects in all of the eligible locations. Because if you'll remember, you can place a suspect adjacent to the victim or two tiles away from the victim. This is a legal play. This, this, and this are not. This is a legal play. Because it's only two spaces away, this, of course, would be a legal play. Eventually, your tableau of suspects will look like this. Not necessarily these suspects, but certainly this structure, with the victim in the middle. Each suspect will have an interview cube on it to show you which player played it. Once this is finished, then you will uh, refer to this. I'm just going to plop it right in the middle of the tableau for now. Uh, and you will score each player's total motive. The way you will do that, put each player's scoring disc on zero. One at a time, take a cube off of a suspect, tally the suspect's total motive towards the victim, and then give that player that many points. Take on in, that many points. Once all one player's cubes are gone, do another player's cubes, and then finally do the last player's cubes. Now this isn't how the actual game is scored, but what this will do is give players practice placing tiles, sussing out where you can get the most points, uh, and navigating the love and hate relationships. Okay, so let me now give you the overall structure of a game of mystery. When a player takes a turn, he or she here she gets uh, one action that is of course a turn once you have gone around the table and every player has taken one turn that is a round once there have been three rounds that is a case a game of mystery consists of three cases now what this then means is each player in any given game is only going to take nine actions uh, there are only nine turns uh, so, furthermore, scoring takes place after each round. Uh, it's not just at each case. So after each round, there's a scoring uh, tally. Uh, uh, an important aspect of the scoring is that the points, uh, there are more points with each successive round. So the first round is worth fewer points, the second round is worth more points, the third round is worth the most points. And you will do this three times once for each case. Now, uh, one thing, uh, so mystery comes with these player aids right here. They're little cards. I actually don't find them very helpful. I think they're cluttered. I think they have a bit too much information on them. Uh, what I would recommend, because there is something on here that the players need access to, what I recommend is taking this scoring right here and saying, forget the little cards, I'm going to make my own player aid. Write this scoring down on a piece of paper, print it out or something, and then hang it on the wall somewhere. This is hugely important for the players to know. Uh, and just to tell you, the scoring works as follows. There will be a primary suspect and a secondary suspect in any, at any given time. 
The primary suspect is the dude or the chick with the most motive points. The secondary is the dude or the chick with the second most motive points. Uh, there is furthermore scoring for an intermediary. Now if the primary or secondary suspect is one or two tiles away from the victim, the person between the primary or secondary suspect and the victim is considered an intermediary. Intermediaries always score one point, invariably, easy peasy. Secondary suspects score one point on the first round, three, uh, two points on the second round, and three points on the third round. Also very easy. Where it gets a little more complicated is the primary suspect. He or she scores three points on the first round, five points on the second round, and seven points on the third round. Uh, of course, the person who interviewed that suspect, whose cube is on the tile, that's the person who gets the points. Now, it may happen that you have a tie. What you do in the course of a tie is these little numbers, I don't know if you can see, underneath each character, under their description, there is a number. So he's Carl is an 8. We have a 16 for Maxine. Lady Louisa is a 20. The lower the number, that determines who breaks the tie. Uh, so in this case, Count Chester with a 2 would break a tie in favor of Carl, who would win in a tie against Maxine, who would win in a tie against Lady Louisa. Mystery isn't just about laying tiles. It's also about playing these cards. Motive cards mix up the action quite a bit, and I'm going to show you a few of them. Basically, on a player's turn, he or she will either play a tile or a motive card. At the beginning of a round, a player will have a hand, I've just made a mess, will have a hand of three motive cards. So the very basic motive cards, they tell you on the card exactly what to do. For instance, Brilliant Deduction, very straightforward, lets you take two additional actions. When you play it, you just do two things. Now many of these cards will have in red text, they're only playable in certain rounds. Remember, once the table has gone around once, that's first round, a second time is a second round, third time is a third round, and then the case is over. A game consists of three cases. So keep an eye out for that. If it's the third round and someone tries to play Brilliant Deduction to get an additional turn, they're cheating. Don't let them get away with it. Many of these motive cards will mess with the markers. This is a relationship token. I might have incorrectly called it a motive token earlier. That's wrong. It is not a motive token. Relationship token. A concealed motive card lets you simply flip a relationship. Doop. Very straightforward, and it of course affects the amount of motive. Someone who hates someone who hates the victim has zero motive. So that would mean Madame Delphine would go from 10 points of motive to zero points of motive with this card. Some of these cards will add what are called motive tokens. And that's why I misspoke before when I called, if I did, call these motive tokens. These are relationship tokens. Motive tokens are played by cards like Psychopath. Psychopath will let you place this token on a suspect, any suspect. And as you can see, it adds four points of motive. If Herr Otto was caught spying by Sheldon and he has five points of motive to kill him, points of motive to kill him. If we make Herr Otto a psychopath, he now has nine points of motive against Sheldon. By the way, this doesn't necessarily imply love or hate. If Madame Delphine was a psychopath, she would have, with these five and these five, that's ten points of motive, plus being a psychopath, she is the secret lover all the more, psycho pathically of Herr Otto, she now has 14 points of motive. Now, something to keep in mind. Let's go back and pretend Herr Otto is a psychopath. These motive tokens only affect the suspect on which they are placed. They do not work upstream or downstream. So in this case, 
you do not look at Madame Delphine and count 5, 9, 14 points of motive. This does not affect her. She still only has 10 points of motive. Her auto now has 9 points of motive. motive. She would still be the primary suspect. These motive tokens, any character can have up to two of them. I had another one here. Where did that go? Uh, here we go. Alibi removes six points of motive. Basically, hey, I didn't do it. Here's where I was instead. If Herr Otto is a psychopath with an alibi, oops, I don't want to cover that number, he is now at a balance of minus two. So this would give him three points of motive to kill in Sheldon. If someone then wanted to play an additional motive token on him, nope, can't do it. He's at his max of two tokens. Too bad. However, there are plenty of these cards in the deck. False evidence lets you remove a motive token. Motive marker. Have I been calling them tokens? Motive markers or tokens. Motive markers, relationship tokens. Uh, so false evidence lets you remove one of these. And by the way, I really screwed up because when players read this on a card, motive marker, it's important that you've been calling this a motive marker when you show it to them. Uh, so, in other words, don't do as I do, do as I say. Some of the more complex cards, actually this one isn't complex. Some of these cards allow you to establish secret relationships. A secret marriage, for instance, will allow you to place this token. And by the way, they say on the back, this six point love is secret loyalty, six point hate is secret enemies. If you can swing a secret marriage, that's eight points of love. Now what secret marriage will do is allow you to place this token between a male and female character who don't have a relationship. So for instance, if Miss Ursula is adjacent to Herr Otto, they don't have a relationship because the two arrows don't line up. If I play Secret Marriage, I can then put this to show that they love each other, they are married, and there is now eight points of motive for Miss Ursula. In this case, Miss Ursula would have eight plus five is 13 points of motive. Her auto would have five points of motive. Madame Delphine would have 10 points of motive. Miss Ursula would be the guilty party in this game. Okay, now let me show you where it gets a little bit crazy. Here is a card called Disguise. Disguise lets you play one of your tiles. And remember, you don't have to match up arrows. So I could put this tile anywhere I wanted, as usual. When I play the Disguise card, I play a tile, and then I put on it this Disguise token. What this signifies is that that is not, in fact, Felix the Opium Fiend. Because at the end of the case, as per the instructions on this card, I will then be able to swap out Felix with any other tile from my hand, which is going to give me a lot of options, and it's going to let me blindside the other players with some scoring mechanic that they're not going to be aware of. Uh, you will note many of the cards do this sort of thing. If you play Disguise, you immediately lose a point. So some of these cards will cost you victory points. Penultimately, this is a card called Second Body. This is really going to throw a wrench in the works because it, what it lets you do is put this token on any suspect tile. Basically, you're killing a suspect. You are making a second murder gum up the works. So, if this is the layout, remember you can't be here, that's three, that's three tiles away, and I do this and kill Miss Ursula, we now have a second center for tile placement. There will furthermore be two primary suspects, two secondary suspects, and a whole new set of intermediaries. So second body uh, basically extends the board in one direction and is going to hand out double points. You can of course only play it in rounds one and two as per the card's instructions. Finally, this is a also the Columbo card, one more thing, lets you play this tile 
to double the scoring of a second interview that you place. What's a second interview, you ask? Well, I haven't explained that yet. I'll get to second interviews in just a moment. All right, now when it's the player's turn, he or she has four distinct actions available. The first action, very straightforward, is to play a tile or a card. One or the other, not both. Uh, we've seen how that works. Pretty simple. Uh, because a player has a hand of three tiles or three cards and they don't replenish over the course of a case, they might feel that they are stuck with no options. So rather than play a tile or a card, the player has the option to draw two. That's draw one tile and one card. They don't then get to play anything. Uh, they've forfeited the option to influence the network of suspects at this point, but they have another tile and another card. The third thing they can do, if they don't want to forfeit the option to participate in playing cards and tiles, is draw and play. And this means draw a card and play it. You must play it. It's not optional. You can't keep it. You can't decide this doesn't help me. This helps someone else. I'm not going to do it. If you draw it, you must play it. You can also do that with a tile. Draw and play. Take a tile. Look at it. You must put it somewhere uh, in, on the table. So play a card or tile. Draw two. That's a card and a tile. Draw and play. Or the fourth action. Uh, there are tokens called second interview tokens. Each player's got three of those. Let's go take a quick look at how those work. One of the actions available to the player is what's called a second interview. In addition to their interview cubes, players will all receive three second interview tokens. The back will have the player's color, the front will have a prime slash secondary, prime suspect, and neither prime slash secondary indicator plus how many points they're worth. A, a, a note of caution, the pink player, they are white on the back. These are going to be placed face down, so it's a little bit of a hassle that pink doesn't have any color. Just keep in mind, that's supposed to be pink. You know what, maybe get a marker color that in. Uh, so on green's turn, as we know, green can either play a tile or a card. Green can draw a tile and a card draw two, or green can draw one, play one. That's draw a tile and play it, draw a card and play it. The fourth option for green is to do a secondary interview. And a second interview involves taking one of these, players should keep these face down so nobody knows which they are, taking one of them and putting it on someone else's suspect. So in this case, Herr Otto is a psychopath. He's got nine points of motive towards the murder of Sheldon. Madame Delphi, the secret lover of Herr Otto, has 10 points of motive. These two are in a secret marriage, so that's 13 points of motive. Right now, if we were to score this, Miss Ursula would be the prime suspect. The secondary suspect with 10 points would be Madame Delphine. So, what the green player can do, he can't play this, the prime suspect. What he's basically doing is gambling, guessing which suspect will uh, fit one of these criteria. So, if Green, as his turn, wanted to play, do a second interview, he might take this one, neither primary or secondary, put it face down on Herr Otto. That is his turn. None of the other players knows what that is. It will be worth two points when the case is scored. Keep in mind, they're scoring after each round. Second interviews only score after the third round when the whole case is resolved. Uh, what Green would more likely do, this is 13 points, 10 points, 9 points. He sees that Madame Delphine, at this point, is going to be the secondary uh, uh, suspect. So for a second interview, he does that. And this is going to add to his score. OK, let's talk about some bookkeeping. This right here is the scoring plat, tableau, platter, whatever you want to call it, that includes the turn order. After each round, and remember, three rounds to a case, three cases to a game, there will be, a, there will be scoring. So if this was the first round, pink played this, purple played this, green played this, first round is over, we now score it. The primary suspect scores three points. In this case, 10 points of motive for Madame Delphine, 
five for Herr Otto, zero for the kindly Miss Ursula, the lonely governess. So the primary suspect being Delphine, purple would get three points in the first round. The secondary suspect is worth one point. That's Herr Otto with this cube. Any intermediaries from the primary suspect or secondary would also get one point. Herr Otto is an intermediary between the primary suspect and the victim. Herr Otto scores one point. That's the first round. Now we move on to the second round. But first, we change the turn order by score in that whoever has the most points, did I get that right? Yes, turn order from the fewest points, the fewest points goes first. Whoever has the fewest points, in this case green, would choose in which of these spaces they would want to go next. They could go first, second, or third. Then uh, or pink would choose, so they want to go third, and then finally purple would be stuck with whatever is last. The turn order will change, remember, between each round. Uh, you'll see as you play, sometimes you definitely want to go last, sometimes you want to go first, um, but just as they're scoring each round, turn order changes each round. Now once you have done three rounds, the case is over. You will discard the body and the primary suspect. That would be these in this case. This was just one round, but there would be three rounds. Uh, you would then let the players, if they have their uh, motive cards, they may choose to keep one of them. No more than one. If you've got three cards, you have to get rid of at least two. If you want, you can get rid of all three. Uh, then you shuffle all the remaining cards and tiles, the motive cards that players got rid of, those will be shuffled into the new deck. Then each player is dealt three tiles, three motive cards, uh, or if they kept one, they're only going to get two motive cards. Uh, and then, once they've been dealt the cards, then they choose turn order, by the way. You can see what tiles and what motive cards you got before you decide when you want to go in, in the turn order. All right, so a couple of final points. Uh, on playing time, mystery should be a fairly short game. After all, each player has no more than only uh, nine turns. Three rounds, three cases, game's over. It should be quick, right? Ideally, that's the case. But, but mystery is one of those games where you really can't plan for your turn until it comes around to you. The state of the board is changing, uh, and the changes are so important and so substantial that you don't really know what you're going to do until the player immediately before you has done whatever he or she is going to do. So if you have players in your group who are slow or who are prone to analysis paralysis, uh, mystery might trip them up. Uh, therefore, uh, I would be careful with the player count. It supports up to five, but depending on the group, it might be more ideal for no more than three players. Uh, four or five, of course, if the, the players understand that there will be downtime while they wait for it to come around to them. Uh, something else to be aware of. Uh, there's no catch-up mechanic, really. The turn order is decided by the player with the fewest points. That's the advantage they have, is they decide for the next round where they'll fall in the turn order. But that's not really that much of a catch-up mechanic. Um, so this is a game where certain players can be shut out, and uh, they're kind of stuck hanging around in last place while everyone else plays. So again, if that's a factor for your group, something to keep in mind. Uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. If you would like to see more of these, please let me know if there's any game in particular you'd like to know about, you'd like me to try to teach you. You can find me at www.quarter3.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at QT3, the letter Q, the letter T, the number 3. Uh, I'm Tom Chick. I hope you enjoy Mystery, and I look forward to teaching you more games in the future.